I always tense up when I walk past my father and thought, you saw me kind of do this a little bit. You know? <laughs> hey, uh, I, I am not much of a sports guy, um, if you couldn't tell by my rolled up skinny jeans. Um, but, but I've never really been, uh, like, I've never had a team that I followed. I, I played different games and sports growing up, but I could just never sit down and watch it or, or find a team or just know when games are. Or, like, I, I barely even know, like, what sports play during which season. So I've never been a sports guy. And a, a couple years ago, I was in Dollar General, uh, a wild place, Dollar General. I was in there, and I, I was waiting in line to check out and there's this older gentleman behind me and, and he asked, hey, do you know what time the game is today? And that question did nothing for me. I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, but, but instead of explaining like I am to you guys that I'm not a sports person, uh, I, I thought I had a pretty good cop out. Uh, we, we really didn't have television in our house. Like we had an iPad that had Netflix and Disney Plus on it. And so I thought I'll just, I'll just let that be my explanation. So I answered him, I said, I wouldn't be able to tell you, we don't have television. And he chuckled and he said, do you homeschool your kids too? <laughs> Ouch, like shots fired. It, it, no, we do not homeschool our kids, but I was homeschooled, thank you very much. Like, wow, wow coming right out. <laughs> So I've never been that much of a sports guy and I don't know a whole lot that's going on, but occasionally, you know, you'll be online, you'll see some, some clickbait, you know, I'll see this article or a clip that interests me. And about two weeks ago, I saw that the uh, Chicago White Sox, we're talking baseball here, Chicago White Sox, um, are not doing too hot, actually. Uh, the, the article that I read said that the Chicago White Sox are on course to finish with baseball's worst record of the modern era. That record is a 21-game losing streak. They lost 21 games in a row. If you're a White Sox fan in here, I'm so sorry. 21 games in a row, like, like one loss will bum you out. Okay, five losses and you're like down in the dumps. 10 and you're starting to go to each teammate and wondering who's sinning, like whose sin is causing this. But 20 games, like surely you lose 20 and you think, okay, just according to statistics, the odds, like surely we will win the next one. And then 21, they lose it. And so then they come up with a solution, okay? And like the problem to me, like surely is the team. Like the problem is the team. And so the solution to me is you've gotta get a new team. Like you've gotta get some new players on that team. But the solution of the benefactors and all the people that love the White Sox, their solution is they fired the team manager and they fired three of their coaches two days after they lost 21 games in a row. They fired their leaders, fired the ones in charge. When people are not happy with a team or an organization, or a country, or a business, or a ministry, who do they come after? The leaders, the ones in charge. And last week, Pastor Lanny, he talked to us about suffering, that suffering is guaranteed in the life of a believer, and when that suffering comes underneath persecution, who is on the front lines of experiencing that persecution? It is your pastors and your leaders and your church staff. In these first four verses of 1 Peter chapter five, Peter writes directly to the elders and pastors and leaders of the early church. He writes to them to encourage them in the midst and in the face of suffering. The persecutors are coming after the church and they're coming after the leaders first and most harshly. Paul is about to die at this point in history. Peter is about to die at this point in history and he already knows what it means to suffer. Like Peter has been in prison, Peter has been beaten. He knows the extent of the danger. He's got a massive target on his back and so he writes to encourage his fellow elders underneath the same suffering, underneath the same persecution and they're all shepherding a persecuted, suffering church. Now, I know that not everybody in this room is an elder or a pastor or a ministry leader, so does that mean that you get to clock out for the remainder of this message you wish? Uh, no, it does not mean that. <laughs> because everything that Peter is writing to the church leaders, it is for them to set an example for the rest of us. 
So everything that he instructs to the church leaders, it's for them to set an example for me and you. So even though this passage of scripture is written directly to elders and church leaders, it's written for the entirety of the church as we imitate our leaders who are imitating Christ. And the truth is, is that everybody here is leading somebody. Like whether you know it or not, you have influence in somebody's life, whether you are a ministry leader, or maybe you serve and you're a team leader on a team here at church. Maybe you're a parent or a grandparent or an older sibling, or maybe you're just an older classmate at your school. You have influence in someone's life. Everybody here has influence and is leading somebody. And so let's all dive in together and listen to Peter's words, to hear what it is to lead well. If you look at 1 Peter chapter five, and we're just starting with the first verse, this is what Peter says to the suffering church. I exhort the elders among you. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. I exhort the elders among you. Maybe it's just because I'm a millennial that I don't immediately like the word exhort, okay? It just kind of seems like a little bit too loud and in your face and boisterous, like it rubs you the wrong way. It kind of reminds me as like a kid, maybe like a preacher or a teacher or a coach is challenging me to do something that I don't want to do. It kind of seems obnoxious. I exhort you to do this. But listen, I know that this is not Peter's intent when he uses this word, that it's not intended to be obnoxious. And so I had to do a little bit studying uh, on my own as I started looking into what this word means. And it's really a beautiful word, exhort. That word in the Greek, it means to call near. I exhort you, I'm calling you near. I'm calling you beside me. I'm inviting you to walk beside me. I'm here to comfort you, to pray for you. I am calling you to my side. I am exhorting you. You are coming to walk right beside me. And that word exhort, it's a verb right here today in our passage, but it's changed four times into a noun in the New Testament. And it's used to describe the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who comes to dwell within us, to walk with us, whom we are bidden to walk with and walk according to the Holy Spirit. Exhortation, the Holy Spirit becomes exhortation, becomes the one who comforts and walks with us and he's our advocate and he sticks up for us and he counsels us in the way that we should go. That is exhortation. Listen, there's a type of instruction or teaching or direction that we can give, and sometimes we can give it in the wrong way to display like, hey, I'm the authority here, I'm in charge, you should listen to me. And it kind of creates like this disconnect between the one teaching and the ones listening. Or, hey, I'm the expert on this, you should listen to me. But that's not Peter's exhortation. That's not exhortation. Peter's exhortation is to draw people near. Like, hey, come, we're in this together. Let's listen to this together. We are coming alongside. We're bringing one another together. We're identifying with people by putting ourselves at the same level. And that's what Peter does. And it's pretty remarkable that Peter would do this, that he would bring himself to the same level as these church leaders he's writing to. Why? Because Peter had a lot of qualifications that he could have appealed to, that he could have exploited. Like, Peter had a lot of qualifications He's the spokesman for the apostles, like the apostles who are leading the church, and Peter is often their spokesman. He preached the very first gospel sermon at Pentecost where thousands get saved. He could have appealed to that. Hey, listen to me, because I'm the one that preached this message. You should listen to me right now. He could have appealed to the fact that he witnessed Jesus' death and resurrection, one of the few that witnessed both of those things. He could have uh, just pointed to the fact that he's a pillar of the church, pillar of the Jerusalem church. But writing to these humble church leaders of house churches in Jerusalem, he identified himself as a fellow elder and not a superior. And one commentator writes, his identification with the elders, it's a powerful example of Christian leadership where authority is based on service, not power. Authority in the church is based on service, how we serve one another not power. Peter's saying, I'm right here with you. 
what happens to you happens to me. But take heart, we're not only gonna share in this suffering together, we're gonna share in the glory that is to be revealed soon. There's a lot of qualifications Peter could have exploited, but instead he chooses words like exhort, to come alongside, to invite, to draw near. He uses words like among and fellow elders and share, conveying this sense of we are doing this together. That's exhortation. And it's a beautiful, compassionate, Jesus-like way of leading. And so here's a question for us. Do I lead by exhortation or exploitation? Do I lead by exhortation and coming alongside and setting an example and drawing near to people and comforting and praying? Or do I lead by exploitation and exploiting my status and position? Leaders, husbands, parents, do we lead by example and coming alongside or by exploiting that status, exploiting others' weaknesses or lack of understanding, or do we come alongside them? Exhortation or exploitation? What did Jesus do? Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to exploit, something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he became a servant, being found in human likeness. Jesus became like us, calling disciples to his side, leading them from their level, and that is exhortation. It's coming near and comforting and leading side by side. Walk with me. For a season, uh, a, a brutal season, it was the month of July and it was so hot, I worked lawn service with, with Trent Davis and uh, I just told him last minute, warned him that I'm about to talk about him in today's message. Worked lawn service with Trent Davis and, and uh, Trent was the boss, which meant uh, he got to be on the mower for the majority of the time, Mr. Mow-it-all as he liked to be called. <laughs> but several times, this is what I remember most, Several times we'd be out cutting grass and Trent would ditch the mower and he would come and he'd pick up a weed eater and we'd eat with us. Or even more than that, sometimes he would actually get off the mower entirely and sit one of us on it, at least on the yards that you couldn't really mess up. You know, he'd put us on the mower and then he would weed eat. He would weed eat with excellence. He would teach us by his example and his solidarity with us. And that is exhortation. So thanks, Trent for leading us by your example. Let's look at verse two. Verse, we've only covered one verse. Verse two. Shepherd God's flock among you. Shepherd God's flock among you. Not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not out of greed for money, but eagerly not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. We have this tendency, and I think it's pretty innocent. Like I was speaking with Pastor Lanny about this earlier this week. We have this tendency that's pretty innocent to refer to church and ministry with the possessive word like my or mine. Like we say, you should come and visit my life group. My life group is awesome. Or I'd love for you to serve on my ministry team. Or you should come visit my church. I love my church. Like we use my to express our relationship to the church. And we're proud to be a part of First Baptist Jonesboro. Is there anybody in here that is proud to be a part of First Baptist Jonesboro? Yes. We love being a part of our church. And so we tell others, come to my church, come visit my church, and don't stop saying that. Like this week, we should all go out, tell at least one person, come visit my church. But Peter makes this clear distinction, makes a clear reference to the flock, the believers, the church, as belonging to God. Shepherd God's flock. You see, nowhere in scripture is the church referred to as being in the possession of an elder or a pastor or an overseer or any other church leader, as qualified as they may be. Nowhere in scripture is the church referred to as being in their possession. The only few times where we see flock or sheep or church used in this possessive idea as mine or belonging to someone is in reference to the Lord. 
Jesus tells Peter, he says, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus says, my sheep, listen to my voice. My sheep, no, my voice. Pastors, ministry leaders, disciple makers, parents, grandparents, anyone in here that has influence over another believer in Christ, listen, shepherd them as God's flock that has been entrusted into your care. Your grandkids, your kids, the person you're discipling right now, man, the congregation, leaders and pastors, you shepherd them as God's flock that has been entrusted into your care. Not out of compulsion, not because we're being forced to do this ministry or, or obligated to disciple others, not because God is manipulating us to disciple others, but he says, lead and serve willingly. Lead and serve others willingly. God has called us to willingly surrender our wills. He didn't just take them prisoner. He calls us to willingly surrender. Doesn't take them prisoner, but he frees them from a prison of sin and shame. And now we're called to willingly serve and lead others on that same path of freedom. Willingly serve, not out of greed for money, or because you get paid for this. Maybe this is directly to the church staff. We don't do this just because we get paid for this, but eagerly because we've been called to this. We have been called to this to serve and lead others. Man, what a great calling that we all have to disciple another, to lead and serve others on that same path of freedom. And if you are not being manipulated to minister to others, if you are not being compulsively obligated to serve others, then don't lead others under your care by manipulation. We don't manipulate others under our care. Not lording it over those entrusted to you is what Peter says. Not lording it over. Whoever you're leading right now, listen, you are not lord over them. You do not exercise lordship over anyone. I do not exercise lordship over anyone. There is only one Lord, one God, one Father of all who is in all and through all and in all. There's one God, one Lord. We don't exercise lordship over anyone. We lead not by being lords over those entrusted to us, but by being examples of what it means to follow the Lord. So here's another question. Do I lead by manipulation or by demonstration? Do I lead others through manipulation or even just pressing all my expectations on them or do I lead by my demonstration of what it means to be a follower of Christ? Do I only ever serve as an enforcer in my household or do I serve as an example to my wife and to my kids? Another question is maybe, do you want others to elevate you? Like, do you want people to see the way that you follow Christ and elevate you and put you on a pedestal and be like, look at them? Do you want them to elevate you or do you want them to imitate you? To imitate your example as you follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Lead by example. Example of what? Example of a servant. We're leaders but we're servants. We are lead servants, an example of what it means to be a servant under Jesus, an example of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Pastors, ministry leaders, disciple makers, parents, bosses, teachers, any Christian leader in this place, we have this role of leading and caring for and shepherding others, but the first thing we have to remember is that we are sheep ourselves. We are sheep First, we are followers first before we are leaders. I think the biggest part of what it means to be a pastor or leader in the church is simply to be the first follower. Like you're right there at the front being the first follower of everything that Jesus says, every movement that he makes. To be a leader is to be the first follower, the lead follower. Paul understood this when he said, follow me as I follow Christ. We just took communion. When Paul says, uh, and is talking about communion to the Corinthians, he says, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. And to be a leader is to be the lead follower. We still have line leaders in schools. Like in public, do we have public school teachers in here? 
Yeah, are there still line leaders? Is that still a thing? Yes, yes, I love line leaders, okay? So I was homeschooled, but I went to school for like a very short amount of time, and the highlight of that was line leader, okay? And so the teacher would pick a line leader, pick a line leader to lead the entire class from point A to point B, whether it was from a classroom to recess or classroom to the cafeteria. Uh, and here's a question, okay, for some of the teacher's hands I saw in here. If, if you pick a line leader... Does that kid then get to decide wherever they want to go and they can just go there? No, it does not. The only place that kid goes is exactly where the teacher tells him to go. The line leader is simply the first follower, the first follower of the teacher, and it's the same way with us leaders. As leaders, we are the first followers and we follow every single movement and command of our teacher, Jesus. I can't help but think that as Peter is giving this instruction to the elders, telling them to shepherd, telling them to shepherd and watch over the flock, that at the same time, he's playing back his last conversation with Jesus. His last conversation at the end of the Gospel of John with Jesus, where Jesus is coming to Peter after Peter had denied him three times, and yet Jesus comes to him to exhort him. He comes alongside to bring him back, to reconcile him and restore Peter. Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then Peter, tend to my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then Peter, feed my sheep. And we cannot miss the last two commands right there in that same passage that Jesus gives to Peter that's wrapped up with being a shepherd. He says to Peter, right after feed my sheep, he says, follow me. He says it twice. He says, you must follow me, which is ironically the very first command that he ever gave to Peter. Follow me, follow me. Wrapped up in this idea of being a shepherd, one who leads other believers, and is this idea of closely following Jesus. The way that we lead is not by being trailblazers into new territory. No, it's by following Jesus. We follow Jesus. I had a professor in seminary that said, the most important thing you can give your church is your relationship with Jesus. The most important thing that you can give to others is your relationship with Jesus. The most important thing a leader or a pastor can do for the church is to personally follow Jesus. I just heard a story of a lead pastor who stepped down from his church, stepped down because he realized he had only ever been doing for Jesus and he hadn't been simply being with Jesus. He stepped down because he used ministry and all this work as an excuse for abiding with Jesus and being a follower. And so he said in a status, he says, now I get to learn what it means to simply be a sheep again and learn how to follow him. Man, and I hate that it got to that point, but I applaud this guy. Man, for the integrity that he has, knowing that he can't lead people to where he's not even going himself. So he steps down instead of trying to keep on doing it and ending with some immoral failure. No, he steps down and he says, I'm going to learn what it means to be a sheep. The primary call of every disciple that we need to keep harking back to is come and follow me. Come and follow me. Man, if the weight of the world is overwhelming you, sometimes you feel like you're not measuring up as a believer in Christ and the accuser is coming at you and he's bringing up past sins or he's lying about you and trying to get you to believe things that are false about God or Jesus, come back to that first call of a disciple. Come and follow me. Come and be with me. Go and spend time with Jesus. Go listen to Jesus as you open his word and he speaks to you. Come and follow me. Hark back to that first call of a disciple over and over again. Come and follow me. We're followers before we're leaders. And even when we're leaders, we're simply lead followers. If you look at verse four, verse four, it's the last one we're covering today. 
when the chief shepherd appears. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. When Jesus, the chief shepherd, appears, he's the chief shepherd, which means any of us, the most we can be are are co-shepherds. We are co-shepherds and Jesus is the chief and he is coming again. And when he comes, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. The image here is of of distinguished Greek citizens and athletes who have been uh, just noticed or acknowledged in their society as some esteemed person, or maybe they won some sort of game in the arena, and they would be awarded these crowns, which would be made of ivy or bay leaves or olive leaves. Like, we can all picture it when we think of Greek. We probably often think of someone wearing this crown of ivy over them. But this biblical scholar and theologian, Peter Davids, he says, eventually... Each of these crowns made of plants withered, withered and the honor bestowed upon these people would be forgotten. Not so with this crown of glory. It's funny because just like ivy or bay or olive, Peter uses another plant to describe this glorious crown, this unfading crown of glory. He uses a plant for the word unfading The Greek word unfading is the name of the flower amaranth. Everybody ever heard of amaranth? I had not, uh, maybe because I am uh, a man, but uh, I learned what it was this week, amaranth. I was actually texting several people. Melissa was one of them. I'm like, hey, what do you know about the flower amaranth? (laughs) Amaranth is a flower that's so-called unfading because it never withers or fades. And when plucked off, it revives if moistened with water. And even when it's dried, you can dry it, hang it and dry it, or well, however you dry flowers, you dry it and it never loses its color. It is unfading. Leaders, stand firm and you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now from best that I understand, pouring through the scriptures. It looks like there are five different heavenly crowns that scripture talks about. And every believer receives at least one of these crowns. And and maybe a couple of them refer to the same thing. There's this imperishable crown in 1 Corinthians 9. There's this crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2. There's this crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4. There's the crown of glory that's in our passage. There's the crown of life in Revelation 2. And we're gonna have a quiz at the end of service to make sure you're Remember each one of those. Are any of these crowns worth more? Or are they like more distinguishable? Or are they more honorable than others? I don't know, actually. My studying for the week actually stopped at that point, and I didn't get to answer that question because here's what I do know that when we are in the presence of the Lord, we take those crowns off and we lay them at the foot of his throne. In Revelation 4, man, we have this awesome scene of the giant, the massive throne room of God. And it has to be giant because all of creation is like trying to get into this place. It says every creature on heaven and earth is coming in to this throne room. There are thousands upon thousands of angels. There are elders there, like the same word elders in our passage today is in there in Revelation 4 that are in this throne room. Saints, our prayers are filling the air in that place. There are these bizarre looking creatures and there are colors that are just bursting and it's pounding. There are these rainbows that are shooting out. There are flashes of lightning in that throne room. And there's this great sea of crystal glass in that throne room. All these colors just bursting with glory. And I just imagine that these colors are just shooting off the crowns and the crowns even just reflect and they make it sparkle all the more. And then these crowns of immense worth, highest worth that one could ever receive from God himself and the elders take these things off and they put them on the ground. They put them on the ground before the feet of our Lord and they say, you are worthy. You are worthy, Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You are worthy. And they worship. And there's this moment when all this worship 
it pauses for just a second. It pauses. All creation is there. Everybody's singing and lifting their voice and they stop, they be still. Because all of a sudden, in the middle of it all, the humblest of creatures walks into the middle of the throne room and it makes everybody stop. And it's this lamb looking as if it had been slain that walks into the middle of the throne room and makes every single person in that place stop. They stop as they behold Jesus Christ, who was slain for us, humbled himself to death on a cross. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is slain for us. They stop and they fall down and bow down and worship the Lamb of God. And they say, worthy is the Lamb who is slain. And that place erupts in worship because of the Lamb of God, the humblest of creatures. And you know the first people to take off their crowns and the first people to fall down and bow before the Lamb of God are the elders, the elders. Listen, if we all get crowns in that place, the elders are the ones who wear them for the shortest amount of time. They lead us in placing their crowns at the feet of Jesus. And I am sure we will follow their example. Pastors and church leaders, ministry leaders, church staff, you lead us to follow Christ by the way in which you follow Christ. You lead us to surrender to Christ by the way in which you surrender to Christ. You lead us to bow down and worship Christ by the way in which you bow down and worship Christ. And we are grateful for you. We are grateful for the example that you set before us. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the call. Come and follow me. And Lord, may we never get beyond it. To come and follow you. To simply be with you. To walk beside you. And Lord, we thank you for pastors and church staff and church leaders and ministry leaders and parents and grandparents who exemplify what that means God, Corinne said it in her baptism video this morning. She realized that she could no longer just teach her kids about Jesus. She had to show them what it means to follow and walk with Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for our pastors. God, we thank you for all those that you've placed in our lives to lead us and show us what it means to be a follower. God, we thank you for our lead followers the example they set now, God, and even the example that they set in eternity. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.